It is August 1st, and that means it's time for me to welcome you back to Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And I am Danielle Hallen. Hey, Danielle, we're back. I know. And it's my birthday month. Oh, <gasps> it is. It is. So everyone has to vote for me or else. Oh, goodness. See how she, <laughs> see how, see how she goes about this? I do. Uh, I played dirty. Any... I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any special plans or anything? Nope. Hopefully okay. I'll be moved into my new home and I will just be hanging out in the middle of a garden I'm trying to build. That's my oh, goal. That's, that's my goal. awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. Wow. New home too. So I got to get you all kinds of gifts, birthday present, <laughs> new home, housewarming gift. Okay. Okay. I got to write this stuff down so I don't forget it. <laughs> um, wow. All kinds of stuff. And it's, there's other stuff happening, Danielle. It's never too early to start planning for crime con. Do you? Want to come to Las Vegas April 29th through May 1st, 2022 and meet Danielle and myself? Do you want to hang out with us at a special crime after crime meetup and have John buy your first round? And hopefully that can be my birthday present. You can buy oh. me. You can be my first round as well. <laughs> OK, OK. I guess I just got volunteered to buy a round. But hey, I'm game. Uh, do you also want to save 10 percent off your crime con admission? then you need to go to crimecon.com and buy your ticket right now using code crime after crime. And after you get your confirmation, go ahead and forward it to us at Vegas at crime after crime podcast.com. And if you are one of the first 10 people to do that, you're in for the meetup. You're going to get a custom limited run t-shirt to wear to the meetup and all of that. Plus all of our best swag, a drink from John and an amazing time at crime con Las Vegas. I just have to say we've done this before mm -hmm. and it was awesome. It was uh, so much fun. We had a great time. And quite honestly, uh, you might get to hang out with other people too. Last time we did this, we had yeah. a bunch of YouTubers and true crime creators. We had John Crimes. We had Stephanie Harlow. We even had Gray Hughes. There yeah. was a bunch <laughs> of people <laughs> that showed up. Um, so it would be a good time. You don't want to miss it. If you're going to CrimeCon anyway, I'm telling you, use the code, forward it to us. We want to get you hooked up so you can hang out with us there too. We really hope to see you there. All right, Danielle, we got business to do. We got to get to the voting results for last episode, Real Life Superhero. Danielle told the story of the rise and fall of mixed martial arts fighter turned superhero Phoenix Jones. I told the story of Shadow Vision, who is hunting a serial killer in North Little Rock, Arkansas. How did it play out, Danielle? All right, so on the website poll, John got 41% of the votes, and I go, wait, wait, no, wait. <gasps> I said it wrong. She did. I got 41% of the votes, and John got 59%. And then on Twitter, pretty much the exact same thing. I got 42%, and John got 58%. Woo! I did it, Danielle. I took it. <laughs> you did. Okay. <laughs> now, listen, I want to say something, and I've been waiting for this moment, and I wanted to actually tell you when it happened, but I was like, I can't. I'm saving this for the episode. Okay. Raylan, my daughter, for those of you that don't know, she doesn't normally listen to any of my work, but she mm -hmm. has her own little iPod thing, and she found oh, she found our podcast, okay? And <laughs> she, she did. I know. She's sneaky. But she listened to the real life superhero episode, right? And she yeah. comes up to me and she's like, mom, look what I listened to. And I was like, wait. <laughs> and then get this. And she goes, I want to go vote. She was like, you guys said in there that there's oh. a website, but I can't. She's, she didn't know how to pull it up. So she's like, I want you to pull it up. And so me, I'm over here like, haha, okay. I'm going to open the website for her. She's going to give me a vote. But do you know who she voted for? <laughs> who did she vote for, Danielle? She voted for you. <laughs> Woo! That just she made did. my day. She did. She voted for you. She's like, I'm sorry, mommy. I love you. She's like, but I really like John's story. And I was like, honey, you do your thing. It is totally up to you who you vote for. But I had to tell you because she was so determined. She was like, you wow. need to pull up this website for me. Well, I need to dedicate today's episode to <laughs> my number one fan, Raylan. Thank you so much. I'm so proud. Thank you for your vote. And Danielle, you have a cup to hand over. Where is that? There it is. I guess I'll give it. There we go. <laughs> Very Thank reluctantly. You. It's okay. I can use my little real life superhero picture mug of you and I. Oh, did you get it? I did get it. Oh, I didn't get mine yet. I got mine. I've already used it. I said in the last episode, I was like, if I ever have a day where I need to feel like a superhero, I'm going to use it. 
And it literally came on a day where I was having a really rough day. Oh, that's and I was awesome. Like, I was like, this is perfect. And so yeah. I filled it on up with coffee and I was like, I can do anything. <laughs> oh, well, thank you to our friends over at turnedyellow.com for both the artwork and the mug. Mm -hmm. now, I'm, now I'm chomping at the bit. I'm looking forward to mine. But we've got work to do today. We are looking at wedding crimes. Now that is stories where criminals and weddings somehow cross over. We've got two unbelievable stories to share with you. But first, we wanted to learn a little bit more about wedding crimes. So AACriminallaw.com has put together a list of the most common crimes they see committed during a wedding. Starting at number three, we have disorderly conduct loud hotel guests, your drunk uncle breaking some furniture. There are many different ways to drum up a disorderly conduct charge if you're at a wedding or not. Number two on their list is underage drinking. Okay. I can personally imagine a little 10 year old version of John going from table to table, finishing off glasses. Uh, that sounds more like current John. <laughs> <laughs> and while some states actually do allow underage drinking with their parent present, what happens if they stay out later or get separated from their parents and police are alerted? Underage drinking charges. And then the most common wedding related crime they see, drunk driving. Open bars can make for a good time, but also poor decision making. Remember to plan ahead and find that sober ride home or use a ride sharing service. A trip home and another trip back to your car will always be cheaper than dealing with a DUI. Seriously, I hear that yeah. that's in the thousands of dollars to deal mm -hmm. with typically. Yep. And if there's other options out there, make sure to take them. Yeah. You can even schedule rides like way in advance. So mm -hmm. there's no reason not to. Yeah. We also found a report at news.sky.com detailing several instances reported to police forces in the UK. Our friends over which, in the UK. Which means buckle in, some strange things are about to happen, <laughs> of wedding <laughs> crimes between 2018 and 2021. And those include Avon and Somerset police said they were called to a fight involving 40 people using glass as weapons at a traveling community wedding. <laughs> There's, I mean, how much weirdness can we stuff into one quote no, there? I feel like this has to be unpacked. What is a traveling community wedding? I don't know. I imagine but it, gypsies. Right, right. That's and like how long does it thing. go on? Is yeah. that something like they just move from country to country? We're in a wedding. <laughs> We've been in this wedding for four years now. I was just about to say. And then using glass as weapons. Like, yeah. are you taking like champagne flutes and breaking the tips off and then having a little sharp edge. I don't know. There's. I wish we could have had a full police report yeah, on that one. I need one. to know more about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, North Wales police said a drunk wedding guest smashed a window at a hotel venue. And when people tried to restrain him, what would he do, Danielle? He would assault the photographer. Absolutely. That's the first person. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's the guy you're going to go after. Makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you got to get rid of the evidence, right? Take oh, out the wow, photographer wait. first. You know, maybe that's actually it. I, I get that. <laughs> And then North Wales police said a person reported that their wedding photograph had appeared on a social media platform and it had attracted 244 negative comments, which is clearly unacceptable and against the law. Yeah, well, you definitely you're calling the police for that, right? <laughs> Absolutely. If that's true. If oh. we're really supposed to report those occurrences, I think Danielle and I need to take the next few weeks off and we're going to be on the phone. <laughs> it's going to be a long time. There's going to be a lot of, you know, complaints that are filed by me. Um, every Saturday that I post a video, I'm pretty sure I'm going to spend all day with police. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> what were they expecting? Complained. Yeah, like what's what's the, what are the police going to... I'm sorry, ma'am. <laughs> like, I know. We're going to go get them. <laughs> And then it makes you wonder, like, have they done this before? <laughs> mm, <laughs> have you called mm. into police about other things that, you know? Yeah, seriously. Uh, finally, a bride reported that her wedding veil had been stolen during the reception. Her wedding veil? Are, I mean, I know they're expensive, but, you know, after you wear them that once, doesn't the price take a serious hit? Yeah. And like, okay, maybe it's just me, but I don't even know where mine is anymore. <laughs> really? <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> and even funnier about it, I was literally standing waiting to walk into my own wedding and I looked over at my friend Lisa, who was my maid of honor, and I was like, I forgot it. <laughs> wow. And she like catapulted herself over a railing and like had to run to go and grab it. So I nice. feel like out of all things, you know, like, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but that's kind of something. 
almost makes you wonder if like, like did a kid pick it up or something like just who who would that who mean steals anything it to? yeah and who yeah. like would be that upset over it it is nah, i don't know everyone's uh, different know. but i don't know what uh i'm not sure if any of these occurrences that we talked about in this intro segment are going to show up in our main stories i don't think so i think uh we might have some different things to hit but we're going to find out right now because as always, we are starting with the amazing and talented Danielle Hallen and her story. All right. So wedding crimes, such an interesting topic to me. I probably could have reported a few at my own wedding, honestly. <laughs> Someone broke my champagne flutes. We won't get into it. I didn't eat my cake. We won't get into it. <gasps> Anyways, so lots of crimes at my wedding. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like everyone's mind usually goes to like theft of wedding presents and money, maybe fraud of some kind, possibly like booking a venue that's not at all what it appears to be, a reception brawl. It's like a treasure trove of possibilities. Um, and, you know, some may even have interesting stories to tell about their own, like I just stated. But what I unearthed is so much more than that. And possibly one of the best stories that I will ever tell on this podcast because we're looking at a criminal and a wedding, but what if the whole wedding is held for criminals? Hmm. Well, well, so, let me just say, she talked it up strong enough, I, I think. I did. But then I, she paid it off. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm already on the hook. Okay. <laughs> well, I was going to say, those, those are some brave statements there. Yeah. Okay. I was even thinking that when I wrote them, but you know, here we are. So <laughs> in the 90s, Shiawassee County, Michigan was going to face face to face against a major drug problem. Unfortunately, I think it's still playing out, but we won't go there. Mm -hmm. um, just years prior, GM had announced they were closing all of the plants in the area. So thousands had been laid off with no new jobs in sight. And so a lot of families that were in need of stability desperately fled the area, more specifically of Flint, Michigan, while drug dealers kind of moved in and took over. Unfortunately, they saw it as an opportunity to prey on the weak, um, get people to join their forces in order to make money. And by 1987, Flint was named the worst place to live in America. Mm. So at the same time this was going on, undercover agents were kind of like a big thing. I feel like we don't really hear about them anymore, mm -hmm. at least not me. And it was kind of the easiest way at the time to spy on criminals, catch them in the act. There was a decent success rate. So that was the way that Shiawassee decided to handle the drug problem. So it started with 38-year-old Debbie Williams. She had already fought against all odds to become a police officer, something that kind of irritated me. But again, hmm. in Michigan at the time, if you were a female, you actually had to have four years of college experience to try to become a police officer. Whoa. Men didn't have to do that. <laughs> right, right. They didn't, wow. but females had to spend four years in college. So she went ahead and bit the bullet. You know, she spent four years at college to hopefully have a shot at her dream. Um, and it even ended up taking her until she was 30 to actually successfully land the position. Hmm. But then she was, you know, face to face with another problem. Because she was a female police officer, they said, hey, there's no one that could be better for an undercover police position because no one's going to think that this woman is a police officer. And so they thought she would fly under the radar. And honestly, it worked exactly as planned. So by the time she was 38, she was given a questionable new partner. Okay. This man's my favorite. So 47-year-old Lacey Moon Brown. And he went by the name of Moon for very interesting reasons that I will get to. But he looked nothing like a cop. He had long, scraggly hair. I mean, straight out of the 80s. Like, it's 1990. Like, he just lived the 80s to the fullest. Had a big old bushy beard. Usually always had food in it. He never took himself seriously. And he also had a pretty gnarly criminal past. He had earned the nickname of Moon for mooning criminals during police bus because he said that if he did that, there was no way anyone would think he was a cop. <laughs> exactly. So just like Debbie, he ended up getting shoved into this box of an undercover agent because he didn't look the part of a cop at all. Yeah. He'd actually began to drink at the age of six. He had been kicked out of the Marines for being too violent. He spent more time in jail for brawls, possession of moonshine, I mean, firearms, charges. And by January of 1972, he kind of decided after decades of being thrown back and forth and while apparently laying on the floor of a California prison that he'd had enough. Yeah. So he said that he didn't want to live this chaotic life anymore. He prayed for a miracle and somehow that was answered. His charges at the time were miraculously reduced from a felony to a simple misdemeanor and he was able to leave. Hmm. And this is what led him to Michigan. 
to start again. He wanted to attend Mott's Community College, where he ended up studying law enforcement, and his street smarts and dedication ended up gathering a lot of attention from a local detective who decided to kind of hire him on the low a little bit to bust smaller crimes in the area. There were a lot of like drinking dens back then where it was like late night drinking that wasn't allowed. Yeah. Um, and so he would go in and bust those. And by 1977, he was sworn into Lapeer County, Michigan police. And pretty soon he became known for his very unusual methods. Specifically, I mean, he's already named Moon for weird reasons, but specifically he busted a murderer at the fairgrounds while on the zipper ride. <laughs> I was so like blown away by that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that there's right? this weird thing that I'm thinking of, like, did this guy just figure out that, oh, my God, I keep getting busted for living this lifestyle. But if I was working with the police, yes. I could still live this lifestyle. Exactly. He really could. <laughs> and he was thriving off of it. I mean, he was like, I busted him on the zipper and like had this guy and everything. <laughs> But by 1990, unfortunately, his cover was blown. So he had to move on, which is how he fell into the lap of this police department. So he had started doing freelance work and eventually married a woman named Beth, who interestingly enough was the sister of a man that he had busted for building bombs. And he had even gone on to bust her father, but she just loved him. So <laughs> it worked out. They bought a house in ironically, North Carolina, where I live, <laughs> and they decided to move their life entirely, but not before one last job. Moon landed a job. That would make him $500 for roughly four months of work. The job was to go undercover with Debbie Wilson and gather as much information as possible from local drug dealers so that they could eventually bring them all down. This was the only way that Shiawassee felt they could get a handle of the situation. So Moon and Debbie began their job together. Moon had, like you said, a blast with this job. He thought this was just great. He was really good at creating these personas. So they decided to make this whole backstory so it was more believable. Debbie went by the name of Debbie Leno. She was actually the daughter of an East Coast gangster named Fast Eddie Leno. And Moon was just drug dealer Danny, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know him, don't you? <laughs> drug dealer Danny. Drug dealer Danny. But they were a, a couple. They pretended to be a couple and they pretended to just be madly in love. Now, they couldn't wear a wire or take notes during any of the jobs. It was too risky. They didn't want to blow their cover. So they actually went out at night in like what was known to be the worst city in America and would take on these drug dealers alone. And then they would take all of that, buy the drugs, remember all of this information, and they would meet this man. I'm going to butcher his name. And I'll probably also say his name about seven different ways during this. I'm just <laughs> warning everyone. Sure. And the YouTube version, I might make you put like how it's spelled. See if anyone can help me. Okay. So his name is <laughs> Sar Sergeant Maurice Wasilishin. Wasilishin. I'll take it. I've got no idea. It's one of those. And he used to be an undercover cop that went by the name of Animal, but now he was working with them. And they would meet in a trailer park just out of town to relay all of the information to him and a recorder while handing over all of the drugs they purchased as evidence. Now, they made sure to become regular customers to get as much information and also hopefully heighten the chance they could actually convict these individuals. Together, they made over 163 purchases from 87... 80, 87? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Totally real number. 87 separate drug dealers. And they play the part perfectly because nobody suspected a thing. Wow. But now, they're not busting them at this point, no. right? They're just kind of collecting, collecting. They're collecting. Okay. okay. But after five months of work, about 40 solid names um, on a list of criminals that needed to be arrested, they were kind of stuck in a pickle. They were having a hard time finding funding to make these arrests happen and the manpower. Mm -hmm. Now, as I said, undercover cops were a big thing, but also <laughs> it started to show the ugly truth to small towns that those funding and okaying these arrests were sometimes unknowingly signing a relative's prison sentence. So across the board, undercover police work kind of stopped being funded. They would like selfishly take away the funding for that and the permission. The federal government also started slowly backing down. So Moon, Debbie, and Wasilishin, Wasilishin, <laughs> they, <laughs> they had to get creative, okay? So Moon came up with this brilliant idea. 
It was his first one, kind of like a go-to to see if it would actually work. Um, mm-hmm. He ended up arresting a stolen property dealer, announced to a local newspaper that this guy had actually just died. They created a funeral, and they arrested all of the fellow gang members that showed up. Oh, wow. But they realized that if they did it like this, where it was like small increments or even just one person at a time, that eventually someone was going to catch on. Right. And Moon was supposed to retire to his eight acres in North Carolina soon. So he was like, we're going out with a big bang. So he suggested they throw together a fake wedding. So Shiawassee County Sheriff LaJoy approved funding to the scheme as long as everything they did remained legal, which, as you can imagine, was like kind of a questionable thing with Moon. I hope I can get you to put up a picture on the Facebook page or not Facebook, but YouTube, because it's just. He, he kills me, um, but he <laughs> vowed to do everything right and they hit the ground running. So all local jurisdictions began to meet together to plan the wedding of a lifetime. Moon and Debbie's wedding, or should I say Debbie Leno and drug dealer Danny's wedding, which would absolutely be bought because they did such a good job at showing off their relationship. Mm -hmm. Now, the plan was to continue business as normal with regular drug deals, but they were going to start handing out wedding invitations along the way, inviting these dealers to a secluded venue called Moore's Family Circle. They planned to bring in Debbie's East Coast gangster dad, Fast Eddie Leno, and he was set to bring 200 pounds of marijuana. Exactly. And he would be stationed in the parking lot a few hours prior to the wedding to do reverse buys. So they were going to catch a couple of these criminals before the fun even began. They would then lure the rest of them into the venue for this wedding and reception and bust them from there. So the police department turned into a major hub of wedding plans. And so when you would walk in, all you would hear was talk about using these confiscated bottles, centerpieces, how Debbie needed to wear her hair for the wedding, arguments over the flavors of the cake, food menus, seating arrangements. I mean, you wouldn't ever know this was actually a police department. Debbie said, and I quote, it felt like it was the real thing. I was actually excited and nervous. (laughs) She was. She was very nervous. So the day before the wedding, Moon and his drug connection, Phil Shooter McCarty, who was also an undercover agent, went around town and dangled this van full of drugs in front of all of the party guests one by one. They said, look, round up your money, come by early, and you'll get your hands on a very large load of drugs. So part one of the plan was already going beautifully. And then the day of the wedding was also going perfect, fast, Freddie. (laughs) Debbie's gangster father, also known as the former police chief, Ed Boyce, drove into town in a beat down camper with Florida license plates, fully stocked with 200 pounds of marijuana and bricks that they planned to raffle off at the reception. Oh, my God. Debbie, on the other hand, she actually was under a lot of pressure at the time. She hadn't found a wedding dress yet. So Moon's real wife, who was about to watch his her husband, you know, marry another woman, took her to a local Salvation Army. They got a beautiful one for $17 at that thrift <laughs> shop. And it actually came with a garter that perfectly fit her Smith & Wesson. So, I mean, it was like it was meant to be. Wow. <laughs> it was. <laughs> The venue was coming together as well. Local stores that supported the police, they actually donated all of the alcohol to supply the open bar. An extravagant cake was made. They did cut the costs. Again, funding was an issue. So the top two tiers were actually just cardboard covered in in icing. Nice. I like it. But they didn't skimp on the decorations of the cake. The cake was decorated top to bottom in blue ribbons and bees made of sugar. Mm. Their secret message that The police were there and they were there for a sting. Wow. I mean, they just sucked it to them. (laughs) (laughs) Not just arrest them, but embarrass them on the way. Like, I mean, just blue, like police blue ribbons all over the cake. Wow. After a month of scrambling, crossing fingers, compiling police files and evidence against each person that they plan to grab, full, like, you know, arrest warrants and all, the day finally came. Officers hid all throughout the property. It was like at the back of a dirt road, like down in the middle of nowhere. Um, Mm -hmm. So they had all these signals set for the whole entire night that would indicate what part of the plan they were kind of going into. By 2.55 p.m. September 21st, the day of the wedding, with everyone in position, the first early drug deal at the venue was made. These partygoers showed up 
$87,000 was handed over to Moon and Shooter and marijuana was loaded into the dealer's car. And then out of nowhere, Shooter pulled his gun and officers started jumping out from every bush and tree in the parking lot. And this is when the buyers realized this wedding was actually a bust. Yeah. Every 20 minutes on the dot, new dealers would come in unaware that previously arrested ones that had fallen into the trap were locked in vans in the same parking lot. Totally locked in vans. This was purposely done so they weren't able to warn anyone, but they, I mean, it was perfect. They were just falling one after another into this trap. And then $1,000 saving a little boy. And then a few hours later, all of the scheduled pickups and arrests were done. I have no clue how this little boy plays in. They just like just so happened to see him in one of the vehicles. Mm. And I don't know if he had been abducted or like something, but they actually were able to save him. So, you know, they're just doing a good job here. Yeah. How many how many busts are we talking? How many people? I don't know how many people at this point okay. had been arrested, but I do have a total at the end. Most okay. of them were arrested in the wedding. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. So uh, phase two of the plan began. The wedding itself, be it started at least at 5 p.m. with Moon's real wife acting as a bridesmaid. She's just a trooper here. And there were armed criminals in every single room. The party was going drink after drink, just being tossed down. Guns and money were just flashing left and right. There was this gigantic table at the entrance where they could buy a $100 raffle ticket to win the gigantic mound of bricks of weed <laughs> yeah and there was actually for a minute where they're like did we mess up <laughs> like sh should we have done this <laughs> yeah sounds like things could get dangerous pretty quick you got a especially lot especially of... with the open bar yeah well and dangerous people and mm -hmm. weapons like what if this thing turned sideways it could go exactly. really ugly yeah but this was like a drug dealer's ideal wedding <laughs> yeah this was perfect so Debbie and Moon ended up being married by retired Flint police sergeant, Mike Parrish. <laughs> and from there, the waiting game or the party, just kind of like depending on perspective, really began. So unfortunately, they thought this was going to be over a lot quicker. But at this point, only half of the wedding party had arrived. So they kept having to fake things and they kept having to go further and further into their plan hoping to get as many people as possible. So Wasselation, his poor soul with his name, he watched from afar. He was keeping tabs on who had and who had not shown up. So they kept drinking up. They were enjoying the cake. They literally had to make sure. They don't think they thought they were going to get there. They had to yeah. make sure they only served like the real portions of cake. Um, and they danced to music by the band, which apparently the band was terrible. <laughs> it kind of makes sense because it was police volunteers. <laughs> But the drug dealers thought this band was great. The band was named Spock. Spock, <laughs> somebody protect our crops. Oh, my goodness. They claimed that they were just these, like, marijuana-loving hippies. Mm -hmm. And so someone protect our crops. But I guess they didn't notice that Spock spelled backwards as cops. <laughs> Man, they really wanted to rub it in. <laughs> Just rub it in. Do you think they went to the to the cells afterwards? Hey, you guys, did you notice? Did you notice this? Did you see what we had here? Did you see in the bathroom we had this sign that if you look at it this way, it's a picture of you being arrested? Like it's I just, know. It's just wow. like one thing after another. I will say, when some of them were arrested, you know how you have to like empty your pockets? Yeah. <laughs> they had to like empty out matchbooks that said like, thank you for coming. <laughs> 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 they had wedding favors in their pockets. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but Spock was waiting for the go-ahead to play the signal song that would bring in all forces. <laughs> and Come finally on. at nine o'clock, I no. fought the law and the law one began to play. <laughs> Are you kidding me? If I saw this in a movie, I'd be like, this is way too over the top. Oh my goodness. I wish I could have been a fly on the wall. Wow. If I'm being really honest. Yeah. As soon as the song began to play, Shooter ran up to the microphone and said, Hey, everyone, let's play a game. If you're a cop, stand up. To the shock of the guests, over a dozen wedding goers stood up, including the bride and groom. And one by one, out of nowhere, Everyone started getting taken down. Police officers that were uniformed flooded in the doors. And there's actually apparently a video of this online. I was not <laughs> able to find a version that actually worked, 
But apparently partygoers at first thought this was a big joke. I'm sure. Like they were laughing. They're like, oh, you got me. Yeah. Until Moon and Debbie started to slap like real warrants onto them. And they were like actually handcuffed. Hmm. All of these individuals, I mean, one after another, were taken to the vans where the other unlucky individuals had been kept quiet. And then they were all toted off to Shiawassee County Jail. They had somehow pulled off like a whole wedding start to finish while also incorporating a bust. And no one thought that was going to be possible. Yeah. So after the job was done, all of the police officers did, in fact, stay and they partied. They had, they had, they had a celebration. Yeah, of course. One of, one of them quoted, you know, you can't have all this free beer and food here and expect us to not have a good time. <laughs> However, this overwhelmed the entire court system. This was one of the largest like one time busts they had done. They arrested over 40 individuals and they were all brought in at the same time. They were charged with felonies ranging from distribution of LSD, marijuana, cocaine, crack, prescription pills. I mean, the list just went on and on. And majority of them, this was not their first run in with the law for charges like this. Now, unfortunately, because this overwhelmed the court system, I guess they were like too busy really thinking about preparing the wedding to think about what it might turn into. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of them were offered kind of deals they probably shouldn't have been because the court was having a really hard time getting you know, them all in. There's a 15 day time period back then. It might be the same now between arraignment and when they have to have a preliminary trial and they yeah. just could not fit them all in there. So over half of them ended up, they did plead guilty. Um, I know that some of them managed to post bail and then vanished into thin air. Yeah. Um, they also had authorities go out and snag the last few people as soon as possible that never came to the wedding. Um, I know that some of them had already heard the word and ran, but others were there. But I will say most of them were successfully convicted in the long run. Um, but yeah, so the idea of throwing a fake wedding was questionable from the start, obviously. Many other attempts like this had backfired on authorities. I guess like at one point in time, they tried to like set up a fake gun shop. <laughs> <laughs> in order to draw criminals in, like police were running this gun shop and then they just ended up being robbed. So, <laughs> yeah, wow. So it didn't go well. But, you know, Moon was also known for having crazy ideas and, and they actually worked most of the time. And Debbie and Moon had built up such a reputation and come up with such an amazing plan that this worked out beautifully. I mean, you would look at the wedding pictures of her and her wedding dress with him and totally believe it. Yeah. Like if you showed me any of the pictures from this wedding, I would have been like, oh, yeah, that's a beautiful wedding. <laughs> <laughs> that's great so who it's would have good, thought you know would have taken down a huge chunk of the city's drug dealers yeah and well and it's it's really a good testament to their undercover work right because they had oh, to yeah. get co connected enough to pull all those people there i mean yeah they had a couple things to entice them like you know the the mm -hmm. raffle for the marijuana and the deals going out in the parking lot like um those are certainly clever mechanisms to kind of help make sure that they're showing up um, but then it's interesting they didn't think about like, oh, what if some people are late and, you know, what crowd yeah. are you talking about here? There's a good chance they're doing business and exactly. they're probably not the most timely people <laughs> as no. it is. Um, but then the thing I was thinking of too, doing an arrest of that size, like holding cells, like, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're, all of a sudden you're bringing 40 people it, in all at the same time. It overwhelmed, <laughs> it yeah. overwhelmed them so bad and obviously i don't think they had really thought about that and yeah. in terms of doing such a good job undercover i do think it was moon's criminal past that really did help in that yeah. and one thing that debbie said when she was interviewed like when by the time she was 60 like one of the more recent interviews she was like i totally trusted him she was yeah. like if it had been anyone else i wouldn't have trusted him to keep me safe she was like but she was like, I could tell from the beginning, like he didn't act like a cop. She was like, I've seen undercover agents immediately be like called out because when they're speaking to a seller, they like instinctively flip their chair around and sit down mm -hmm. like it's an interrogation. And she's like these small things that you wouldn't think, you know, it just gives it away because you're so used to doing it. And she's like, and he didn't do any of it. Yeah. She was like, he talked like he had done this his whole life because he had and like he just they did it they worked perfectly together and she was so determined to be a police officer that she wasn't about to mess up so it ended up being perfect and i mean this was a huge huge bust it's one of the most famous busts out there 
Um, and it was really interesting to see all the different news articles. It like spread like wildfire everywhere talking about how insane, th- insane this was. I think one labeled it like a real shotgun wedding. Um, <laughs> it was really, really cool. And Moon was able to make it to North Carolina after this fake wedding to live with his real wife, Beth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he did receive a bonus, I think, for doing an outstanding job. Um, Debbie actually ended up marrying Wasilation. So now her last name is also as confusing to say. Um, <laughs> but it, this time it was a real wedding, but it was just very interesting to see that. And like, yeah. imagine growing up and like having children and grandchildren and then being like, tell us about your wedding and just being like, which one? <laughs> right. And right. like having that kind of story to tell. Yeah. It was pretty awesome. And I will say a huge thank you to Ranker and Atlantic.com. The Atlantic.com article on this is so phenomenal. And it was actually like, people fought to buy rights to it to try to like make something out of it so they do it good was work. a really good one yeah 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 i've bumped into a couple of cases i've looked into and man yeah they do some really deep dive investigative work on that yeah awesome wow danielle i was not expecting that but um that was a good one i think you hit it we have a wedding and we don't just have a criminal we've got tons of criminals in that mm-hmm. story so um man i've got my work cut out for me we're gonna have to see what i could pull off right after this short break do you know about my secret helper in the kitchen hello fresh they get rid of the stressful meal planning and their no contact delivery brings a box right to my door with everything i need to pull together a delicious meal in about 30 minutes With more than 25 recipes featured every week, eating healthier has never been easier. Want to get in shape for summer? Check out their Calorie Smart meals. They also have Carb Smart, Vegetarian, and Pescatarian options. Four out of five customers say HelloFresh helps them lead a healthier lifestyle. They also have everything you need to get grilling, my personal favorite, grilling bundles, burger packs, surf and turf packs, spend more time outdoors and less time in the store. How do you manage all of this? It's quick and easy with the HelloFresh app. I can easily skip a week, pick alternate recipe options, and this week I needed an even easier extra meal, so I added a spinach and artichoke flatbread to my order. It not only tasted amazing, but was also ready to eat in less than 20 minutes. You've been hearing us talk about it. I was personally just thanked for ordering my 88th box through HelloFresh. So now (laughs) it's time for you to beat my record and go see for yourself. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime14 and use code CrimeAfterCrime14 for up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. Try Newsweek's most trusted meal kit company of 2021. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime14 and use code CrimeAfterCrime14 for 14 free meals plus free shipping. Didn't you hear us the first time? Exactly. I'm not going to say it again. Try (laughs) America's number one meal kit right now. All right, you guys, welcome back. That was a whirlwind of a story. I hope my claims at the very beginning, (laughs) I hope, I hope I did it justice. (laughs) I think you did a great job. You did a great job. Um, you, you've got me quaking in my boots here. So oh, we're, I've we're, got all the faith that you're going to do a great job. I'm telling you, there, there we'll it was see. a plethora of information out there. There are some crazy wedding crimes I wasn't expecting to run into. So I can only imagine what your story will be. about. That's true. It was it was a pretty wide uh, field to pick from. But uh, let's see if I made a good choice. Duluth is a mid-sized town in Gwinnett County, Georgia, with a community described as close and tight knit. Full of history and Southern charm, some would say this area is the perfect place for a grand Southern wedding. And that's what Jennifer and John were planning. The couple had hit it off instantly, staying on the phone for hours discussing their faith, football, and their love of running. In August of 2004, after 10 months of dating, John sprang the question, putting a three-carat solitaire diamond on Jennifer's finger. It's pretty impressive, man. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, three carrots. Soon, they were making plans for Saturday, April 30th, 2005, when Jennifer was going to put on her veil and walk down the aisle. How many people were at your wedding, Danielle? Mm, Probably like just under 100. Mm. My first wedding was just over 200. My second one, I said, no, we're not doing that again. 50. (laughs) (laughs) Um, John and Jennifer 
we're planning on having 600 guests. Their bridal registry included over $20,000 of gifts. That is a lot of thank you notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know. I like struggled with like the few that I had to write. I would never be able to do that. <laughs> do you remember that? I remember yes, going through I that do. like, yeah, for like nights in a row, like just sitting at the coffee table. Okay. Okay. My mom kept having to call me and be like, Danielle, have you done them yet? And I'm like, I'm going. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Uh, not only that, so we got 600 guests, mm -hmm. tons of gifts. Their wedding lineup was going to have 14 groomsmen and 14 bridesmaids. There were reportedly not one, not two, but eight bridal showers. Well, think about it. You've got 600 guests, right? So you got to yeah, have kind of makes sense. Yeah. Multiple different parties. Mm -hmm. So you can actually spend a few minutes with the bride and give her a gift at those parties as well. Wow, I know. Pre gifts <laughs> to the big gifts. <laughs> Don't you wish you had their wedding planner, Danielle? Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. So we get closer and closer four days before they were scheduled to walk down the aisle on the night of April 26, 2005. John came home from a run. And Jennifer was just getting home from work. She decided she also wanted to go out for a run, just a quick five miler. She put on her running clothes, took off her ring, leaving it by her keys, strapped on her New Balance sneakers and headed out the door. John busied himself around the house, lost track of time and soon figured out something was wrong. Jennifer should have been home after about 40 minutes. It was now two hours and Jennifer hadn't returned. The town quickly mobilized a massive search effort. More than 100 officers were working on finding Jennifer, including local police and the GBI. Tips came in from as far away as California, which were being fielded by the FBI. Guests and members of the bridal party joined the volunteer search efforts and missing posters were going up everywhere. A search command center was set up. All eyes were out there looking for Jennifer. Unfortunately, Jennifer didn't use a regular running route or route. Uh, she would mix it up. Thankfully, John was aware of several of them, and that info was used to help focus their search efforts. They initially started with a five-mile search area and then kind of branched it out from there. Canines were brought in. A bloodhound was taken to where Jennifer lived since they needed a sample of her scent. Since she had recently tried on her wedding dress, that's what they used with the bloodhound, and they also used her room for them to get her scent and then try to pick up her trail. Her family went to the press begging for her return. The inevitable question of did she run off intentionally would come up. Each time it was quickly knocked down by the family. Police also had that consideration initially, but police chief Randy Belcher noted the longer this investigation continues and she hasn't shown up, that theory is dwindling quickly. Uh, the search efforts started paying off. A clump of hair was found near a Duluth office complex. Seemed to be the right color, but it would have to be sent in for forensic testing to be confirmed. They also found a jogging outfit and sent that to the lab as well. A little over a day into the disappearance, police officially classified it as a criminal investigation. Investigators started looking into local sex offenders, as well as friends, past boyfriends, and co-workers of Jennifer's. A troubling tip came in saying that Jennifer was killed and her body was left in a dumpster. No information was found to confirm it. As with all disappearances of this nature, her fiance John was investigated heavily. Three computers from his home were seized and he agreed to take a polygraph test. Despite the steps forward, after a few days, the boots on the ground search efforts started to peter out. The search command center was dismantled. The family started planning a vigil and announced a $100,000 reward. Then John's phone rang. It was Jennifer. She didn't know where she was and she was crying about them cutting her hair. Trying to calm her down, they finally got her to look at a phone book to determine where she was. She was near a 7-Eleven store in Albuquerque, New Mexico. What? <laughs> 1,400 miles away from her home. So they had her use another phone to call 911 while she was staying on the phone with the family. And here's some of the transcript. Dispatcher, do you know who did this to you? She says, no. And did they just drop you off at that location? 
Yes, at some street, right up the street. I don't know where I am. I don't even know who I am. And I'm just lost, just sitting here. Okay, and the person who did this to you, was it a he or a she? It was a Hispanic man and a Caucasian woman. It happened in Duluth. Did they have weapons on them? Yes, she cries. How many? They had a pistol and a small handgun, she said through tears. Finally, local police find her. They do note that she looks different. Her hair had indeed been cut and is uneven. Thankfully, she's finally with police, finally safe, and on her way home. Back in Georgia, John and his family are relieved and literally celebrating outside the family home. One picture of John looks like he's a little kid on Christmas morning. His smile is just stretched across his face. His eyes are wide open. Yeah. Jennifer's back with law enforcement and telling them about her ordeal. As the conversation continues, investigators start having doubts about aspects of her story. Danielle, what's wrong with your face? I've just been waiting for this. <laughs> That's all. I've just been waiting for it. Okay. Well, let's see if you're right. As they press into these details, Jennifer seems to get more and more uncomfortable. Soon, she breaks down, admitting that she had indeed run away. She had bought a Greyhound bus ticket a week before her disappearance, and it was going to expire if she didn't use it. That was the last day it was good. So she grabbed $140 that she had in cash and she left. She admits that she did cut her own hair, mm -hmm. and she did it at that office center where they found the hair clumps, so they were right about that. Uh, the clothes, I don't see any information, and I don't think they were right about that, because when they find her, she's basically still wearing the same sweatpants. Yeah. Um, investigators learned that she called a taxi to pick her up during her run, and then headed for the bus station from there. Her plan was to originally head to Austin, Texas, but she changed buses in Dallas, headed to Las Vegas instead. She Why like, not, okay. right? Sounds like a good time. Let's go there. <laughs> yeah. Maybe she was trying to get there early for the crime con meetup. Possibly. Crime after crime party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, from there, from Vegas, she goes to Albuquerque. Uh, it's said that she was living on candy bars and fast food, basically trying to stretch her $140 as far as it would take her. Wow. As reports of the truth came back to Georgia, the celebration outside the family home quickly ended. Reported, reportedly, family members ducked inside. They drew the blinds to avoid the eyes of the press. Reverend Alan Jones, who was set to perform the wedding, commented, Sure, we were all disappointed, maybe a little embarrassed. But you know what? If you remember all the interviews yesterday, we were praying, at this point, let her be a runaway bride. Mm-hmm. So God was faithful, Jennifer's alive, and we're all thankful for that. A few parts of the 911 call transcript also had some clues that I picked up on when I read through it. Uh, at one point, she told the dispatcher, I was kidnapped from Los, from Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> a little slip there. Yeah, a little bit of a slip there. A little slip. At another point, the dispatcher asked, did they just drop you off right now? And she replied, no, I don't even know how long ago it was. They didn't drop me off here, away from here. But the most telling might be when the dispatcher asked, what direction did the kidnappers leave in? I'm sorry? What direction did they live, leave in? Do what? What direction did they leave in the van when it dropped you off? I mean, I got a, there's somebody trying to use the phone. What directions did they leave in? Uh-huh. I don't, I have no idea. I don't even know where I am. Did they go right or left out of the parking lot, Jennifer? I'm sorry? Did they go right or left out of the parking lot? We weren't in a parking lot. We were down the street and they went behind me and I went forward. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, man. Oh, so essentially, she got to Albuquerque. She had burned through most of her money, had enough to make a phone call, and nowhere to turn. So she decided to call home. Why did she do it? Her lawyer says that she was simply stressed out. Quote, she just says that she had an awful lot going on in her mind. There was a lot going on in her life. 
Yeah, man. When you're under that kind of pressure. So, yeah, I mean, that's a huge wedding. And both yeah. of their families are kind of affluent families. Uh, his family, I think his father or someone real recent in the family history was mayor of this area. Oh, man. Uh, you know, plus the whole big Southern wedding thing, but apparently this was going to be like the wedding of the century. Like th that's what they were going for. It was, yeah, just huge, huge pressure. But the description of the kidnappers was interesting and a, kind of a little problematic. It actually came from two people that sat next to her on the bus. That's who she was describing. And where it gets problematic is she was telling the police that, you know, she was like sexually assaulted. Yeah. One of them was a Hispanic guy. So yeah. of course the Hispanic community kind of comes up on this and they're like, Hey, we, we deserve an apology. What are you yeah, doing? Yeah, of course. Um, so on Saturday, April 30th, the day of the planned wedding, Jennifer walked down an aisle. Are you serious? Well, it was the boarding ramp of the plane bringing her back to Georgia. Yeah. And instead of her father leading her, it was two police officers. Mm -hmm. And instead of the veil, Jennifer had a striped blanket covering her head. It's reported that none of her family was at the airport in Georgia when she arrived. And that plane ride that she took was full of media because everyone knew she was coming back. So they all bought oh, tickets on the same plane. Oh my gosh, you're joking. <laughs> no. Nope. Oh. What a nightmare. <laughs> She's sitting on a plane and it's just full of media. Now, I do think she was in first class, but still. Uh, they were all there wanting to break the story of Jennifer Wilbanks, the real life runaway bride. One newspaper went with the headline, There Goes the Bride. Mm -hmm. Her uncle, Mike Satterfield, made a statement thanking people who had helped in the search for her. Quote, Jennifer had some issues the family was not aware of. We're looking forward to loving her and talking to her about these issues, he said. Jennifer released a statement shortly after her return saying, quote, I assure you that my running away had nothing to do with cold feet, nor was it ever about leaving John. So when she gets back, John actually gives her the ring back and yeah. they, they still plan on getting married. Jennifer checked herself into a mental health facility but it wasn't long before the community backlash started. The search yeah. effort was exhaustive and expensive. Yeah, I was about to say, that's like a lot of, I mean, that's a lot yeah, of yeah. resources just like thrown it. Instantly pulled on. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about something that really takes place over the matter of three or four days, but mm -hmm. it was intense yeah. and tons of overtime. They pulled, it was all hands on deck for, you know, these families, like I mentioned, these are affluent families as well. One of them formerly tired, tied to the mayor's office. So yeah, uh, the mayor of Duluth estimated that it cost the city between 40 and $60,000. Her signs, the missing person, missing person signs were written over with the word not added above the missing. People were like marking up the signs that were still left out there. Jennifer was charged with one misdemeanor count of falsely reporting a crime, which carried a possible penalty of a year in jail, and one count of making a false statement to a government agency, which is a felony punishable by up to five years in jail. In a plea bargain, she agreed to plead no contest and receive two years probation. She agreed to pay over $13,000 back to the city of Duluth, uh, essentially, that was, I think, just for the overtime that was yeah. charged. Uh, $2,500 in a fine that went to the sheriff's office. She agreed to stay in mental health treatment. And on top of all that, she served 120 hours of community service. After her, her probation period, her criminal record yeah. was expunged. They actually just wiped it. Uh, when she went to community service, though, guess who was there? All those people from the plane ride, the media was there taking pictures of the runaway mm -hmm. bride, wearing her orange vest, mowing lawns, washing cars, and picking up trash. The story went national and even spawned merchandise. There were runaway bride bobbleheads. Oh my gosh, are you serious? Yeah. Jennifer's high tail and hot sauce, <laughs> which claimed to cure cold feet. <laughs> and there was even... A $25 runaway bride action figure with the same kind of jogging pants, but she wore a t-shirt that said Vegas baby on it. Oh my gosh. And it came with a striped towel accessory to cover her face. 
but I'm sure that Jennifer and John didn't see any of the proceeds from that. They did, however, sign a book deal worth half a million dollars. No book ever came out of that. And in May of 2006, the couple split up. Jennifer then tried suing John for all of the money from the book deal, as well as money that was earmarked for their honeymoon and personal items, which were reportedly wedding shower gifts that were given to them. John filed a bunch of countersuits. Ultimately, they both drop all of the lawsuits and decide to go their separate ways. In 2008, John got married in a small, quiet wedding at his parents' home. He would get divorced four years later. In 2010, Jennifer began a long-term relationship with a man named Greg Houston. Uh, People Magazine reported in 2017 that they were still going strong, but she had never walked down the aisle. Albuquerque Police Sergeant Trish Hoffman said, I was glad that she was okay and not murdered in this horrible incident. Mm -hmm. Then the rest of it kicks in. She couldn't handle what was happening at home. She made up all these horrible things that she said about what people did to her when, in fact, none of that had happened. So I think it kind of went from angry to disappointment to feeling sad for her. Yeah. I mean, it's very desperate to do that. I was about to say, if you're going to cut your own hair off, like if you're, yeah. I mean, that's like, ooh, you yeah. have to be really going through it. <laughs> you're going through a big yeah. break from reality. Yeah. And, and even just trying to plan an escape. You exactly. Buy a, you buy a Greyhound bus ticket and you have $140. That's just yeah. not sustainable. And exactly. And like, she like seemingly didn't really care too much where she ended up or yeah. like what she was going to do when the money ran out. I mean, you're just thinking it's like fight or flight mode. Like you're thinking, right. I got to go. I have to get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. The the mental health component is certainly mm-hmm. a, an important piece to, to look at with all this. Uh, even though her record was expunged of the occurrence, her police file isn't totally clean. In the mid-90s, Jennifer had a little run-in of theft and shoplifting charges. In one of them, no joke, she had literally stolen a bridal magazine. Oh, boy. (laughs) Talk about foreshadowing. Yeah, I'm very confused about her. Yeah, well, I mean, who knows? I mean, that that could be a sign of mental health issues as well. I Mm -hmm. mean, it was kind of... um, I don't know. I mean, some of those charges I looked into and the money amounts are pretty serious. Like one of them turned into a theft charge because it was like a thousand five hundred dollars worth of like merchandise or something. Some of the other ones. Yeah. Some of the other ones were smaller, like a couple hundred dollars from this store or that store. But I don't at least from what I've seen, I'm not getting the sense that she was doing it because she was poor and she needed this stuff. I mean, obviously, she's stealing a bridal magazine Mm -hmm. almost like I don't know if it's thrill motivated or if we're just looking at other you know other severe uh, mental health challenges with this but i'd like to thank the gwinnett daily post abc news new york times ad week cnn people magazine the spokesman east bay times and wikipedia for information contributing to today's story there's also an episode of a show called scandal made me famous about this case if you want to check that out it's season three episode five and is available to watch for free on Tubi. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. And Runaway Bride actually used to be one of like my favorite movies when I was little. Yeah. I don't know what it was about it. Me and my mom would watch it all the time. There's a lot of people that think that that movie was based off this occurrence. Really? But yeah, but the time's wrong. They've, okay, I was about to say, was the timing? Yeah, but, no, okay. Runaway Bride, I think, I think came out in 99, and this is 2005, so... Uh, did it maybe influence her? I, was about I don't to know. Ask that, yeah. 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 I don't know. There, I haven't really found any quotes or comments that really point towards that. Um, well, I'm I'm curious too to know if like, I mean, did she call him because like because it she ran out of money or maybe did she see that people were looking for her? I don't know how she would have seen that, but you know, you never know. There was quotes in some of the 911 transcripts that I saw where she said, "I guess it's been on CNN." Um, so I don't know if she had seen those reports mm-hmm. herself or if her family was telling her that. Cause remember she was on basically two yeah. phones. She's on the other phone with them. So they might've been telling her. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, but with how this story kind of blew up, I mean, she had an opportunity to see it. I yeah. don't know how much media you could be checking in 2005 when you're sitting on a Greyhound bus for yeah, three exactly. days, but, um, yeah, who knows? Oh man. But think about the possibility, like with the description that she let out, cause she gave a pretty 
solid description on the kidnappers because yeah. they were real people. They were sitting across from her. Well, yeah, but she gave very vague descriptions of everything else. So she sure did pinpoint the people that took her. Right, right. What if, you know, I mean, what if law enforcement keyed in on those people? I mean, this this could have gone in really, really terrible way. Yeah, if she had kept up with that and not been found out and they went looking for that, found out the Greyhound bus she was on, like they could have easily narrowed it down to those people. And then all of a sudden you have like two complete yeah. strangers going through something so. That's one of those things where I, you know, man, like I hate that she struggled with mental health issues. I really do. And I hate that that's what pushed her, you know, she was pushed to do. But talk about like super bad decisions. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. man, I feel awful for like everyone involved. All I can think about is, you know, she was going through a lot, obviously, but what her family also went through, you know, and the man she was supposed to marry I mean, if you're finding clothes and clumps of hair, I would assume the absolute worst. Right, right. Yeah. So I feel like just everyone in that entire story really went through it by the end of the day. Definitely. That's that's one of the hardest things. I mean, y you look at all the resources that are pulled in for something like that, and it's like, mm -hmm. okay, well, these are professionals, and they're used to, you know, honey, I'm not coming home because I have mm -hmm. to work overtime. Like there's, But the families going through that, uh, all that emotional turmoil – and then the embarrassment, like, yeah. you know, wait, media asked us about this and we stood by you and said that you would never do something like mm -hmm. this. You wouldn't just run away. And now I look like a fool on, you know, the 10 o'clock news because, um, but I think they understand that there was something much more deeper than, than that going on. With yeah, her. absolutely. And it also um, kind of makes me angry because when you're surrounded by 600 plus people that you're willing to invite to your wedding, I'm kind of yeah. sad that not a single one of those 600 people picked up on something going on or that you felt good enough to reach for help exactly. or talk to some some of them yeah. about what was going on yeah yeah man you can go a million different ways with that yep well that's the story of the runaway bride turned criminal mm -hmm. man these weddings are interesting <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. Well, we've got a few more to talk about. It's time for some extra stories. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and get this one started. Some wedding guests are given the chance to take home a centerpiece from the reception. Kind of a little bit of a tradition. Some mm -hmm. people like to remember. It's a great way to keep the memories alive. But a woman took this to a whole other level earlier this year. The bride's sister-in-law who was actually currently on the outs with her husband, the bride's brother. Mm -hmm. uh, she came to the wedding and the reception. While things were winding down, she decided to take the centerpiece. Then she took about 30 of the wedding favors that were there for other guests. Then she took four bouquets belonging to the bridesmaids and the vases that they were in. Oh my goodness. But she wasn't done, Danielle. She also took the bride's bouquet. Ooh. Which included a memorial charm with her deceased mother's picture in it. When the bride found out about it and asked her about it a few days later, she replied, I just thought they were nice. Are you serious? Yeah. But you know what's so unfortunate about that is I can almost kind of see that because like coming like I planned my entire wedding myself. I yeah. did like all the decorations and everything. So much of it just kind of like gets lost. Like it's just, you know, it's either like trashed oh, yeah. after or like whatever. So maybe like she really was just like, mm, almost no felt one's like she's cleaning care. up. Yeah. She's right. like, no one's going to care if I take it. So I'm taking it. Yeah. But the brides, yeah. ooh. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bit much. And just, you know, you wonder about the emotional component of her kind of being estranged exactly. from the bride's brother at that time. Like and you just come in there to like be angry. <laughs> yeah. Are you just kind of taking it out on the family? I don't know. Well, I have one that I really, really wanted to be my main story. Mm. I really did. But there were no criminal charges in the end. So I was like, I can't tell the story. I feel like that, like maybe cheating. Yeah. I might be able to pull it off, but I have to tell it. So I added it here. So in April of 2021, guests received an invitation to a suburban 16,313 square foot mansion. Woo! dubbed the Wilson estate to attend a wedding for the royal couple, otherwise known as Courtney Wilson and Shanita Jones. 
Okay. Now, the invitation told a beautiful story about how the couple reconnected 30 years after high school and how it was a proposal over pizza and then how amazing their life was going to be and the wedding was going to be at their new dream home. This house boasts 15 bathrooms, nine bedrooms, a bowling alley, a theater, a bar, a pool with a waterfall. It had everything. It was going to be the most amazing wedding. The wedding was to start at 3.30 p.m. on the 17th, followed by a red carpet cocktail hour. That was supposed to last to like 2.30. And then it was even rolling into the following day with a Sunday brunch. Now, the only problem with this amazing, really outrageous wedding is that um, this wasn't their home, <laughs> nor did they have permission to use it. The but wait, home... they're royalty, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. What? Okay. The okay. royal couple at the Wilson estate. Mm. The all, you know, the home actually belonged to a man named Nathan Finkel, who inherited it from his father, who owned IHOP franchises all over the country. And since I found the story all in one as a pancake, I just had to let everybody know. <laughs> um, but Nathan had actually been trying to sell the home for two years for over five million dollars. Courtney Wilson, the husband to be, actually found this house on Zillow. Hey, mm -hmm. that's where you find all the good stuff. Absolutely. And posed as a buyer months earlier to come and check out the property. Oh, he, was he saw it. it had been on the market for a very long time, saw yeah. how extravagant it was. And he was, he was casing the joint for his secret event. Yeah. He actually came back multiple times, even more close together weeks prior to the wedding. And there was one time where he asked Nathan, he was like, look, Pretty sure I'm going to buy this. Do you mind if I host my wedding here in the backyard first? And Nathan said, I don't know you. Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. So he decided that despite this no given to him and despite the fact that he definitely didn't have $5 million to buy this house, that he was just going to pretend it was his house anyways, invite everyone over there and trespass to hold their wedding. But you need staff to do something like pull off a wedding. Like, oh, is, is Courtney going to run around? And, hey, let me get the food for you. I'm going to go back and cook it. Don't <laughs> worry. He showed up that day. Yeah. At the front gate. Trying to get in. Backed by the decorators. People ready to make food. The whole nine yards. And was shocked when he was met face to face with Nathan. Because he didn't know Nathan actually lived on the property. <laughs> What he heck? thought it was vacant. And so he okay. just planned on getting there, opening up the gates and coming inside. And Nathan had called 911. He actually said, I don't have the exact quote, but he was like <laughs> telling 911, he was like, these people are telling me that it's God's will that they have their wedding on my property. And I don't know what's happening. All I know is I want it to stop. <laughs> wow. They were just at the gate saying it is God's plan for us hmm. to be married here. You need to let us in. Obviously, that wasn't going to happen. Authorities ultimately told them to leave or they would be charged with trespassing. So they angrily left, avoiding charges or comment, but they definitely did not avoid embarrassment. Mm, no, not at all. Wow. Could you imagine planning an entire wedding and inviting hundreds of people to a wedding at a house you claim is yours? And then just like all on this, like, how did they think they were going to get away with that? I, I mean, even if you do, do you feel good about it after? Oh, but like who thinks they can genuinely <laughs> hold a wedding at a home that's not theirs? Like uh, Florida, Florida, man, Florida. They can, just can they just, just don't care. <laughs> they just don't. Wow. Wow. That poor Nathan. I know. He was like, <laughs> yeah, just I, went, like, I know he was just hanging out. He was just trying to sell this house. He didn't want any of this. Yeah. I don't know why people get so nutty around weddings, but it does happen. Mm hmm. Uh, Mark Saunderson was enjoying the beautiful wedding and reception at the Grand Plaza Hotel in St. Pete Beach on the beautiful Florida coast. Oh boy, here we go again. <laughs> Why do so many of these stories come with Florida? I don't, I know. don't know. The drinks were good. The crowd was happy. Then something kind of strange happened. Mark cut in on the groom to dance with the new bride, but he did this during the first dance. Ooh, boy. <laughs> mm -mm. At that point, the best man and the groomsmen started wondering, uh, who is this guy? Oh, who no. is Mark? <laughs> they quickly found out 
no one knew him because oh, Mark no. was a wedding crasher. <laughs> they removed him from the reception, and apparently this turned into a game of cat and mouse with Mark hiding from the hotel security. He was eventually found by authorities and charged with disorderly conduct. As to the newly married couple, the bride wasn't really too upset because she's a fan of the movie Wedding Crashers. Oh my gosh. So she's like, oh, this is great. (laughs) Well, not quite. But she said, quote, it's one of my favorite movies. So I feel like I had this coming. Oh, man. (laughs) I feel like it just adds to the entertainment value. I guess so. But, you know, cutting in on the first dance. I mean, that's a little... (laughs) <laughs> it definitely is. I also feel like I'm the kind of person, though, if that happened to me, like that would be one of my favorite stories to tell. Right, right, right. Yeah. And then we realized no one knew who and Mark was. then we was. realized, who is this man? <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's actually kind of terrifying. But I actually also have a story about a wedding crasher, a serial wedding crasher. I don't know if that's like an actual word, but she created it. Hmm. So Sandra Henson just couldn't turn her cheek from all the amazing gifts and cash that normally come along with weddings, you know, or maybe she just wanted to be like the one woman and steal all the bouquets, I don't know. (laughs) But this is why she got nicknamed the wedding crasher by authorities. Now, Henson is known in a handful of states. Yes, you heard me right. Multiple states for continuously crashing weddings and stealing all of the couple's goods while the ceremony takes place. In just April of this year, She was charged with brand larceny in Memphis, Tennessee, and authorities were shocked to see when they looked into her record that this was actually a pattern. She was at the time in the middle of serving a five-year probation sentence for stealing over $1,000 in goods at a 2017 wedding in Benton County, Mississippi, an entirely different state. And also during this probation, they saw a few years after this incident in Mississippi, she was arrested from stealing from two different weddings in 2019 in Florence, Alabama. And then once they finally sat down with her and talked, you know, got even deeper before her original heist that they knew her from in 2017, she had been charged in two other Mississippi wedding thefts. Does she have a story? Like, how do you make this work? Do you show up and you're like, oh, I'm Aunt Mary's fourth cousin. Nobody knows. Nobody wow. knows how she finds these weddings. No one knows how she hops states. Like, is her sole purpose of traveling to show up at somebody's wedding to steal things? And families have come forward since and they're like, someone needs to stop this woman. Or we need to put her in a traveling wedding. I've, yes, heard, I've learned she about needs those to be recently. In those travel- <laughs> she is the traveling wedding that you hear of. Right. Get your glassware ready. <laughs> no, but she actually was at one of the weddings and I guess like she would just casually walk in and like lean over guests and like take things from the tables. Wow. That's so crazy. She can't be stopped. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Theft is one of the things there was more on the lists that we started talking about earlier. Theft was one that came up and there's literally people that will uh, crash these weddings like that, but then go Mm -hmm. in and sneak around and steal purses because people, everyone's leaving their purse and then they're going to dance. Yeah. 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 And there's people that are coming in. Take your purse behind you. Yeah. I'd like to also file a formal complaint about one huge crime from my wedding. Okay. Someone tapped my keg wrong. Ooh, foul. See? I know. Arty foul. I had just arrived too. (laughs) The first thing when I walked in the doors, no cheering. They were like, "Um, someone tapped your keg wrong. Now, is it ruined at that point? Yes. Yeah, yeah. There was no Uh. drinking my favorite beer. Don't worry. The other beer I got that I didn't like as much, but was like for other people that enjoyed it. Yeah. That one was fine. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> You're not bitter at all. <laughs> not at all. I'm I'm totally fine. Oh my goodness. But now is the time, you guys. Who is going to win this month? You guys get to vote as always. Who told the best wedding crime story? It's going to be another close one. Both of those were awesome. I can feel it. You can vote at the Twitter account at Crime After Pod for these first seven days after the episode drops, or... You can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We always have a link in the description box below, or you can still click the little letter I up in the corner and it will take you right there. 
at crimeaftercrimepodcast.com. You can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, which we love when you guys do. Thank you so much mm-hmm. for the help, how to join our Patreon or shop our Teespring store. And a huge, huge thank you to our patrons that we just love oh so much. You guys get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly, which is always a lot of fun. You get to learn a lot more about John and I. Plus, patrons get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special once they sign up. That's right. Next month, we will be back with another new episode and new topic, showbiz crimes. Mm-mm-mm. curious to see how that's gonna go i know i'm ready to dig into the dark <laughs> side i'm very interested usually i have like an idea of how like which way it might go not so right. sure this time it's pretty wide yeah mm-hmm. i don't know but i know it'll be fun mm-hmm. and interesting this show is produced and hosted by myself daniel hallen and the amazing john lorden If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And the best way you can help others find us is to tell them, tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you love crime after crime and they need to check it out. And we will see you guys next month. Bye-bye. Bye.